Welcome to the Valley Advocate Podcast, featuring interviews that take us deeper into the people and happenings on the local scene. For more podcasts and a closer look at what's going on in the Valley, visit us at valleyadvocate.com. Hi, this is Dave Eisenstatter. I am the editor of The Advocate. Welcome to the Valley Advocate Podcast, uh, which is a collaboration with Amherst Media. I'm here with arts and culture editor Gina Beavers. Yes, and we are here with Yana Talon Hicks, who is our sex columnist. <laughs> I was going <laughs> to say sex education columnist, but I can leave that out. Same thing. Yeah. Our sex columnist and relationship therapist. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. So glad to have you here. Thanks. So tell us how you got started. Um, so it's a little bit of a long story. <laughs> um, I'm a born and bred local to Western Mass. So I actually went to Hampshire College. And when I started there, I intended to be a creative writing and photography major. Um, but I ended up taking this class called Youth, Sexuality, and Education. It's about the state of sex education in our country for young people, mm -hmm. um, which, as we know, is really bad, mm, yeah. um, which is a big motivator in my work. Um, so I ended up twisting my major that way because we can make our own majors. So I just got really into the idea that sex education is awful and that there are ways for us to make it better. Yeah. Um, so I really got into that. So that with the way. creative writing, you definitely wanted to be a writer. Yeah, I really did want to be a writer. I was like writing since I was like a little kid. Yeah. I would like publish books. Oh. In like oh. in like notebooks. That's so cute. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. They're really cute. I bet. They were are. they like Were they like one offs or did you copy them and I had give them a, to I all had your some people? chapter books that oh. I wrote. <laughs> um, nice. My actually, <laughs> my mom's favorite chapter book that I wrote was called The Chub, and it was all about a tiny dog that was fat <laughs> who who also was magical mm. oh my gosh so that's going to come out next year i think it exists under still. penguin press or yeah, something yeah, yeah, like yeah, that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could have a whole new ball game in this thing and be a billionaire yeah so what happened after you left hampshire um so after i left hampshire i ended up going to san francisco so i got a grant i worked with carol queen at the center for sex and culture um and then i also worked at good vibrations which is a feminist sex toy store um, they are famous for making the Hitachi magic wand famous, which as we know, is very important to me. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I ended up falling in love while I was there. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated, I moved back um, and I ended up living there for a couple of years. And then I also wrote for a national lesbian magazine called Curve while I was there. So I was like selling sex toys by night, I was writing by day, and naturally those two things kind of went together. Perfect. Uh, and then when I moved back to Massachusetts, I just like wrote in to the advocate and I was like I really want to write a sex column like please let me do it and they were just like okay sure go ahead <laughs> so much easier than you thought yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was so nice and people are like how did you get the column and I'm like well I did this thing where I asked mm -hmm. for what I wanted which I, is very translatable to the work that I do so it's kind of perfect that it ended up that way That's and we're cool. so glad to have it absolutely the, yeah. Yeah. it's something yeah. I remember um in the advocate a long time ago there would always be some kind of sex column or something yeah to that ask effect. isadora was there yes. before i came mm -hmm. and um we used to read it out loud at my office yes. and just like have such a good time and i read yours and i'm just like she's so thoughtful oh, mm. she's so thoughtful and so so intelligent about this stuff thanks i bet you get good feedback yeah i do get a lot of good feedback which is really great um, and really encouraging. Yeah. I don't get a lot of harassment, which is very rare in this industry, especially for women who are sex educators and especially sex educators that are online at all. Yeah. So many people in my online sex education communities, like, cause we all like to stick together, um, just get brutally harassed, like mm. death threats, like all kinds of stuff, wow. like stalkers. I've only gotten, can I say dick pic? <laughs> I've yes. only gotten yes, one can. unsolicited dick pic on all of my social media, which is like, wild that statistically is, speaking that is like rare i'm like a diamond in the sex educator wow. rough every every so often you'll get an angry face on our on our facebook when we post something. but like that but other than <laughs> other than that i think most people really love it no a couple of people have over the years of me doing the column which has been i think seven now um over the years I, people have sent in handwritten stuff here like i've gotten snail mail mm. and oh. some of the old editors oh. that are no longer here would check in and be like do you want to open the snail mail do you want to see your hate mail and i was like eh, i mean you have it so i don't need to see it good for yeah you. Good yeah for you. that is good i i'm can you talk a little bit about like kind of the state of sex education and what you personally are doing to kind of mm. turn that around sure. 
Um, so, I mean, right now it's kind of confusing because uh, state by state, all of the sex education laws are different. Right. Um, but generally, I'm hired by private entities and schools. So I don't actually, I can kind of skate under the radar as far as what mm. is sort of being funded by the state or the government, um, which means I get to do all kinds of stuff. Um, so usually that more so looks like I do a lot of consent education for the younger sets, uh, younger being like teenagers, mm -hmm. um, which is often absent. I do a lot of education that includes LGBTQ students, which often it doesn't in state funded sex education. Um, we actually talk about like the pleasurable aspects of sex, mm. you know, in a developmentally appropriate mm -hmm. way. But that stuff is so often missing. Right. It's Absolutely. all like. At the beginning of a lot of my college workshops, I asked them what they've learned about sex in their high school sex education. Um, and you know, it's all like STIs, STDs, unwanted pregnancy, all the risks, which are important to know about, but it's just a lot of like doom and gloom. Right. And it's like, in reality, kids are very smart. They all have Google. So it's like, they're smarter <laughs> the than Google. we were. <laughs> right. They're smarter and more uh, resource than we were at their age. And we like to pretend like they live in a box. Right. But they know that adults are having sex because it feels good. Like adults aren't just having sex because they're like, oh, like STIs are cool. <laughs> like that's right. like not the driving yeah. force. There's like other stuff going on. Right. So sex ed education is kind of geared toward don't do it because sure, all these bad things yeah. will happen. Yeah. But ignoring the fact that that kids are mm -hmm. doing it. And there's all these studies. And I've, I've posted a few of them on my website because they're also great. But there's all these studies um, like in Norway in Sweden where sex education is incorporating pleasure positive stuff mm. different bodies LGBTQ students and talking about sex and specifically consent early early on in developmentally appropriate ways right. but early on um, and their rates of teenage pregnancy STI transmission non-consensual uh, violent acts are all way lower than ours Wow so not yeah not shocking, not shocking. <laughs> so yeah. honestly to me just like popping the bubble that is pretending that these students don't know these things is really important mm. and I think that goes a long way in kind of like fighting back the stigma of sex and sexuality because that stuff really sticks with people yeah and if you can't talk about what feels good to you then like you really are enforcing this idea that like sex should be like you shouldn't talk about it you should just like do it if it hurts whatever if mm. like STIs happen like be ashamed and that stuff isn't helping right anybody you know so that's all. Yeah. And no, well, <laughs> That's I mean, it. just in your in your column, I mean, I feel like you, it's almost like every single one, you kind of go out of your way to be like, and this is like the pleasure positive uh, perspective on this. Sure. And, you know, I, I think that it's kind of, you're constantly reminding people that like, yes, this does feel good. And yes, yeah. we are doing this for fun. And it's not supposed to be this negative thing sure sure and sometimes it is and that's okay but yeah. there needs to be I mean it's not okay but like there's two sides to the coin it's just fact, right? right and we need to talk about both we right. can't just talk about what is scary because then we're reinforcing the idea that it's okay that sex is scary right. and that's just kind of like ugh, for a lot of reasons how do the kids take to it um, pretty good, yeah. So one of the consent workshops that I do the most is called Consent and Cookies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's really approachable. Um, and like basically what we do, it's like this whole metaphor where we are frosting cookies for each other with decorations and things like that. It's this whole metaphor about like communicating mm -hmm. to get the best possible cookie you could ever want. Hmm. Um, and we have some little plot twists that we throw in there like I always assign like one member of the um, partner, the cookie building partners, where I'm like, okay, so you are gonna be like really pushy. You think that you know what's best for everybody. And they really have a lot of fun with it. So like right. one of the kids will be like, you don't want red M&Ms, you want blue ones. Like I'm pretty sure you want blue ones. And then we talk about it, right? So we're like, what was that like? Like, did you feel pressure? Like what else could have happened? How could you have dealt with that? Like what should have this person have done otherwise? and things like that but the, it's like again they're not stupid they know right. that we're talking about a metaphor here right and then we kind of talk about how this folds into the rest of their lives how can you advocate for yourself how can you ask questions what does communication look like that is healthy um and there's sugar involved so it's very mm. motivating um and it's really good it's really good i think a lot of the time consent like traditional consent education really demonizes like it kind of sets it up like all female students are being protected and all male students are being demonized right and I think that what's happening as consent education in a traditional sense 
gets more and more popular, which is great. I have noticed that when I go into classrooms to teach like consent and cookies, oftentimes the younger male students are really resistant to it because they feel like they're there to be yelled at. Right. And the women tend to be there in a way that's like, okay, like I don't have a lot of agency in this situation. Hmm. So by doing this activity, I'm trying really hard to sort of even out the playing field in a little bit of a way where like consent is viewed as something that's mutual, mutually beneficial and mm-hmm. it isn't just about shielding somebody or making sure somebody else isn't doing something bad. Right. Um, so if we can look at it, and with college students we do this like how does consent lead to better pleasure? Um, and with the younger students we talk about how does your communication lead you to get the best cookie that you want. Mm. Right. Um, how, so what, what age is the cookie one? I mean, because it seems like it could be a number of Yeah, number it's really groups. flexible. So I usually start that workshop with like a slideshow and we talk about components of consent and we kind of break it down. We talk about power dynamics and age and all that kind of stuff. Um, But so that part is pretty flexible. So if I'm doing, I've done consent and cookies for college students, so we'll talk more explicitly about sex and that workshop. But for younger students, like I think I'm doing one this spring in Brattleboro and Mm -hmm. we might have students as young as 12. but usually that's a high school, right. high school age right. workshop. Yeah, it's really fun. That sounds like yeah, that it's sounds great. So beneficial. Yeah, and the parents I suspect are. Yeah, I haven't gotten a lot of pushback from parents, yeah. which is interesting, um, because I always expect that someone sure. will have a problem right. with the tattooed weirdo coming in talking to their kids about <laughs> consent or sex or whatever you know but is that on your business card tattooed, tattooed, tattooed weirdo. weirdo coming in to talk to your kids about <laughs> sex <laughs> yeah that's, that's what i do <laughs> that's who i am that's who i am that's awesome. um I, what can we do to like change the entire nation so that we have more <laughs> tattooed weirdos i know right? teaching our kids teaching about consent. sex Oh, God. Um, I don't know. I mean, honestly, so much of this is a pretty, like, being a freelance independent contractor is really hard, right? It's like a big hustle. Um, And we talked about this a little bit. It's like people know that I'm a sex columnist and they think that I'm like Carrie Bradshaw. I'm just like floating around with my Cosmos and my (laughs) Dior shoes. uh, Just like writing my column once a week and like (laughs) that'll do it. Right? But that's like not how it is. And then you get your big fat check from the advocate. Exactly. (laughs) Totally. And then the advocate is like $88 on me. Yeah. Right. Um, But it's a hustle. It's really hard. And so, like, it's great because the sex educator community on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all of those people were also connected. Um, And we talk a lot about how people can support us just by supporting our work, right? Right. So I have some people that are, like, diehard supporters, right? They always hire me to teach workshops. They always buy my merch. They're always buying, like, I just um, printed a zine called Explicit Permission, um, which is all about desire and consent. And they bought, like, a big old bulk order of that. They're always the first people to buy tickets to my events. You know, people that really back the work. Yep. It's important because otherwise it doesn't happen because we don't have state funding. Right. Um, Mm, And the people that do have state funding are teaching. And, like, you know, that is valuable, too, in a lot of ways. We don't want no sex education. Right. um, But they are limited in what they can do. Mm -hmm. And because we're freelancers, we have a lot more, like, flexibility. Um, And it doesn't even have to be financial, you know. Just, like, like our post. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or whatever. Right. Have you ever tried to get state funding? I mean, at, like in mm-hmm. California, uh, mm-hmm. over here, mm-hmm. I mean, is is any state better to work with than any other? I don't actually really know mm. the answer to that. I have not tried to get state funding. I would imagine that it's probably a huge pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> You'd rather just be Carrie Bradshaw. I'd right? rather just be Carrie Bradshaw. So if anyone has that button lying around that I can push. We'll see yeah. what we can I'll find. Just, somewhere oh. in the office, I'm sure. <laughs> somewhere in here. Yeah. yeah. Um, and l- like uh, when you're um, like when you're writing the column, like what are the what are the questions that really engage with you? Like mm-hmm. I because w- I'm always reading this column and I was like, oh, man, this question is so great. Like, you know, do you get like a whole pile mm-hmm. of questions and you choose like, oh, that's the best one. And yeah, it's actually really interesting. So it's kind of like a, a not super greatly kept secret that many <laughs> sex columnists sort of make up their questions. <gasps> Rumor has it. <laughs> but I will tell you, we don't have to do that. Mm. The V-Spot right. doesn't have to do that. Yes. Which is amazing. Like, it, I get plenty of questions. And that's so good to know because I've wondered that. Yeah, you're oh, like, yeah. who are With these almost people? almost any column, yeah. you know, it's kind of yeah. like, oh, I wonder if 
that's for real. Or yeah, not, no, they're, they're all real. real. They're all that's real. So cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is really cool. That is cool. Um, so I tend to just I kind of pick them. I try to do them in order because people don't like to wait. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but I try to just sort of pick the ones that I feel drawn to that day because I like to put my authentic energy into sure it. Um, and I don't like to feel like I'm like. Ugh. I don't want to talk about that. This is hard. (laughs) Um, I do feel like it's harder. Well, that's not even true. I've gotten really uh, very into answering the emotional relational questions. Mm. And I think I just, I graduated with my master's in marriage and family therapy um, this past May, like probably six months ago. Yeah, thanks. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Um, So I feel like applying that sort of skill set to the column has been really fun. Um, and I find that I feel like it's feeling like a little uh, fresher to me yeah. to answer that stuff, which yeah. is great. Um, but I also do really like the good old fashioned like sex toy puns. Mm. Um, <laughs> anytime I could like come up with a good metaphor, I'm like, ooh, yeah, I'm going to work this metaphor until it's dead. <laughs> You're yeah. Yeah. So anything else you'd like to ask Miss Yana? Yeah, I'm I'm good. I, I, do you have a, do you have anything to plug? Anything coming up? Oh, your Gosh. website number one. Oh yeah, okay. So I have a website. It's yanatalenhicks.com, and it literally has everything that I ever do ever on it. So that's, so that's cool. where you can find my therapy work. That's where you can find. I'm doing coaching sessions online now that are oh, themed that are really fun. Um, so I post all those there. All the columns are there. I have resources on there. There's a photo gallery. I'm on Instagram at the underscore V spot. V like vagina. (laughs) (gasps) Um, And that's where you can find pictures of me and my dog Brewster, who I know you all love. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Brewster really powers powers the bills in our household. Yes. So, yeah. Well, He's every dog best. should, right? Yes. Pretty much. He's got to earn his keep, you of know? Course. Yeah. Th- course. Those two scoops of wet food every day are really <laughs> costing me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And on, like, the second to last page of every advocate. Every advocate. Oh, yes. Yeah. And online. And yes. online. And yeah. online. Yeah. That's where you can find me. Well, thanks for, so much for yes. coming in. Thanks for so having much, me. So much fun. Yes. Thanks, Yana. Bye. <laughs> thanks for listening. And don't forget to visit us at valleyadvocate.com. Dot com.